All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dave Farina, and I am an amateur astronomer, just like the rest of you guys. Uh, but uh, during the day, I am a teacher, and I run a planetarium in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, at Manheim Township High School, um, where we bring elementary groups in um, to do planetarium shows and get them excited about science, uh, K through um, eight. And uh, then at the high school, I'm a teacher, and I run um, the planetarium for our astronomy club and also for our uh, astronomy classes. And I teach other, other, also other sciences, like Earth and space stuff um, and physical sciences. Um, I uh, also have uh, been doing this Cosmos Safari stuff now for about four, three or four years. I made a video about the Black Forest Star Party uh, about 2017 or 18. Um, and uh, as a result, they, they've asked me to come out and just share some uh, of my ideas. Uh, with you guys. And so today's discussion um, is I hope to not necessarily provide anything that's maybe new to you, but maybe try to organize your thoughts um, in a way that maybe you didn't think about before. Um, and the goal of this is to help you figure out how to set up a night of observing or imaging, okay? And they're obviously two very distinctly different things um, that it maximizes whatever it is that you want out of it, okay? And, and that can really vary quite a bit. It could be um, if you're a visual observer um, and you're new out here, you're just, you're just happy to find a handful of objects, right? Um, if you're a more experienced observer, you might have a laundry list of items that you've been wanting to get to. They're probably hard to get uh, access to under light polluted skies. You're coming here, you wanna make the most out of it. Um, it could be you're an astrophotographer and you really um, want to just hone in on one target all night long and get as much data as you can, or maybe you want to go through a shot list and just kind of get a snapshot of everything and see as many objects as, as you want. It doesn't matter. I think the, the point of it is that to have a plan is a great place to start. Um, now, honestly, how many of you came this weekend with an actual plan in place? of what exactly you wanted to do, okay? Now, I realized last night, I realized last night that things kind of got murky, um, what, 10, 10 or 11 p.m. or so. It got nice again later on. Did anybody see that? Um, and then kind of got cloudy again, and then it got nice again. Like, so the, the plan that I'm, I'm proposing here is exactly for that purpose, right? What do we want to look at? What is priority number one so that you get the most of this trip? For me, it's four hours to get here. Um, and it's time away from my family and it's very challenging at this point in my life to get up here and do these things. Um, so to, for coming up here, I wanna make the most of it. And for me, honestly, this weekend was all about, you know, getting up here, getting to reconnect with all of you guys because I really do miss the community and, and you know, with COVID and everything, it's been challenging to get out and do things in public. So I'm very happy to be able to be here live with everybody and, and sharing uh, my, my passion for this um, with everyone else who has an interest. Um, I'm using a, a set of software here called uh, Starry Night. Um, many of you probably have played with a planetarium software before, yes? Um, th so this is, this is uh, one of them. Um, and it's also uh, the same makers as uh, Sky Safari. Um, so I actually have this uh, little information thing because um, this same um, informational page is gonna be next to uh, the giveaway, the free giveaway at the raffle today. So if you'd like a, a free copy of Sky Safari 7 Pro, um, that's one of the things that have been donated um, through me uh, and our friends at Simulation Curriculum who make the software. So uh, pick one of these up, and they also are doing a 50% off sale as a result of this um, as a thank you for everybody, and, and everybody wins if you don't get the raffle winning. Um, so when coming up here, you know, the first thing you might start to want to think about is what season you're in, of course, right? Seasonal constellations. And for me, that means there are places in the sky in particular in the southern parts of our sky that just simply won't be up in three or six months. It's gonna be a full six months to a year till I finally get a chance to look at these objects again. 
And so when nightfall starts to happen, which, you know, astronomical twilight's for around 8-ish right now, um, 7 o'clock p.m. is our actual sunset time, but it does take time to completely get dark. Um, but by that time, we still have in the south, Sagittarius. Um, we've kind of, at that point, this is 9 p.m., let's go back by an hour. Um, we've kind of started to lose Scorpius. There's Scorpius um, right there on the horizon. As you can see, it's, it's right there at sunset. And so most of the point of going to, to Scorpius is kind of over by this point in the, in the season. You might, might get a chance to look at it, but Sagittarius is still up. That being said, though, you know, if you wait till November, it's, it's down, even lower on the horizon. Very difficult. This is basic stuff. I mean, I realize most of you probably, if you've been in, in this hobby for a while, this is, this is okay, obviously, Dave. You know, this is things to, to consider. Something that I kind of had to appreciate over more time, though, is it's now October, and it's no longer 7 p.m. at sunset. So guess what? We get to still have Sagittarius which is kind of nice, right? It gets darker earlier. In fact, it gets dark at one whole hour earlier. And then we get to November. And once again, okay, at that exact same time of 6 p.m., Sagittarius is below the horizon, but if we back it up by an hour, now we're getting to the point at sunset where Sagittarius is just no longer worth it. It's, it's too low on the horizon, you know, and the, you know, for, the, for those of us that are kind of just coming into this hobby, uh, the basic premise is this. You want to look at things that are as high up in the sky as you possibly can, right? Because there's about 100 times more atmosphere when you're looking across, the at the, like, across towards the horizon versus if you're looking straight up, right? And so you're never going to get that here in, you know, Pennsylvania, even in the months that are the best months, you know, back here in August. When you've got Scorpius and Sagittarius, they're still super low on the horizon. What do I have to do to fix that, though? Move south. Move south. Yeah, I have to go to the Winter Star Party, which I'm, I, would, I would complain so much to go to the Florida Keys in February, right? That is a thing, by the way, if you didn't know. Um, not been there myself, but uh, it's definitely a bucket list item. And by doing that, by going south, now that wouldn't necessarily fix this problem because it's a different season because um, it's February, but, but you, you would have to go south to get any better view of this. So you work with what you've got. If you want to look at the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius, that's where you would have to go. Okay? So that's the first thing on my personal list. Does anybody look at the, that part of the sky last night at all? Okay, was that your reasoning by chance? Maybe just that it was like the last chance you'd see it or just... Yeah. Right, right. So it's such a rich... So for me, that was like, these are friends of mine. These Triffid Nebulas and the Lagoon Nebulas, they're old friends. I've seen them for years. And it's like, hey, cool, I get a chance to, to meet you once more. I'll see you next year. You got one more observation I'll get in before the end of the season. OK, so that's uh, number one for me. Now, uh, once again, you know, with it being, um, let me get this to our current date again. Which is what, the 4th, 24th? Um, so, you know, of course, uh, we have Andromeda rising in the east. Once again, a very common, very easy target, nothing special here, all right? But for me, um, being that I don't get a chance to come up here very often, I had an experience here at Cherry Springs my first time here. Now, I want you to all think about that. Maybe some, is anybody here the first time ever? Welcome, okay. So, so... For me, my first time here was back about 15 years ago. I was here with my brother, okay? And um, we came completely unprepared. <laughs> and I mean completely unprepared for the cold. And how many of you felt like that last night? There it is. And how many of you felt wet last night and didn't expect the dew? Okay, well that was the part that really got us, is the dew. And so we were like, oh, this is awesome. We're going to sleep under the stars. And we put out our air mattress. And we got all nice. And we got our telescopes out. And we got all set up. And then we came back to the air mattress. When we were ready to go to bed, it was like a pool. It was soaking wet. And so we slept in the car, sitting up, shivering, 
like, my brother and I, are, we get along, but like, <laughs> all right? So that was my first experience, but that's not the part I'm trying to get to. I woke up at 3 o'clock. I had to use the restroom. I woke up. I walk, walked outside, and I, I'm super dark adapted now. I've been sleeping, and I got out of the car, and I looked up, and I was like, whoa. It had cleared out. It, you know, the dew that had just been here, it just fell, right? And that in itself clears the sky out. So although the dew is kind of unfortunate and it's a mess, it also makes sure you get nice, clean-looking skies. And I got out there, and I could see absolutely everything. I run a planetarium, and I was lost, absolutely lost. And that's why the plan needs to happen, right? And for me, the first thing I saw was I looked up in the sky, and I was like, what is that? And I, I was not sure what it was. And I walked over to another guy. I happened to be running his telescope yet, like 2, 3 in the morning local guy I found out, and I said, what is that? And he goes, well, what do you mean? And I said, that, what is that thing in the sky? And he said, you mean the Andromeda galaxy? And I was like, what? I mean, there's no, there's no telescope here. This is just visually looking up, and I could see Andromeda. And it was visible last night. Did anybody see it with just your eyes last night? Excellent, yep. Yeah. So for me, that's just an experience that you cannot get anywhere else. I come to Cherry Springs for that experience. So that was my next thing on my list, is I wanted to make sure I got a chance to visually look up and see it. I also got a chance to look through a nice big Dobsonian last night at this. Uh, I didn't even set up my telescope last night. I walked around and I made sure everybody else's telescopes were operating at their peak efficiency. <laughs> I checked with my own eyes. They were doing really well. So um, I got a chance to look at Andromeda, like, like I said last night, through a really nice uh, telescope. Is Roxanne around? Roxanne? No? OK. So um, you know, that was my next thing on my shot list. And you know, there it is, for those of you who are kind of new to the hobby. Uh, Andromeda Galaxy is our next closest galaxy. It's about 2.3 million light years away, which means that the light that's traveling to your eyes is taking 2.3 million years to get here. And your eyeball is the first thing it's ever hit. And you killed that photon. <laughs> you're photon killers. When you're looking, it's hitting your retina. It's being transformed into a signal to your brain. And that photon is effectively dead. It's not going to keep going. You kill it. It's 2.3 million years old, and you just killed a photon. <laughs> Unbelievable. But I thought it was great to chance to come up and see Andromeda. Now, Andromeda, of course, is pretty low in the sky once again. Um, and it's going to, of course, because of Earth's rotation, over the course of the night, it's going to get better, right? It's going to get higher and higher and higher. And let's just turn on some helpful little things here um, in this software. Um, one of the things that I like to use to just kind of get my, my bearings is a number of these, uh, these guide systems. Now, has anybody ever heard of your zenith? OK, the zenith point directly over your head. Right? Um, so if you go to like your local altitude and azimuth system, which is your, basically your, your cardinal directions, right, left, up and down, right? A azimuth is the cardinal directions, and altitude is how tilted you are looking up. The zenith is the point directly over your head, 90 degrees. Okay? The next thing to put on is the local meridian here. Um, and the local meridian, you can imagine it's like a, a, a line that goes from the south through that point directly over your head, your zenith, and back to the north. Now, why I'm bringing this up when I'm talking about Andromeda here is, if you look, Andromeda is going to continue to rise hour by hour. I'm going to look south here and zoom out just a little bit for us. Okay, um, As we go hour by hour, Andromeda is going to get closer and closer to that point. This, when you get to this local meridian, no matter what you're looking at, is going to be the highest point that that particular object will reach throughout the night. Meaning what? Best view. Best view, exactly. This is the optimal view that you can see that object at. But if that object was higher on your priority list, clouds rolled in. You've got a choice to make early on in the night. And for me, the choice was, I want to view it when it's still low. And I'm glad I got a chance to, because Clouds rolled in. This is now a 218. Now, actually, at 218, I believe it was already starting to clear out again. 
Um, but then this clouds came rolling back in. So I would have maybe I was thinking, okay, I'm going to plan and wait till Andromeda gets to that because it's optimi optimal conditions. But is that your goal, or do you just want to see that old friend, right? And this is individual, whatever plan it is you're making. But that is the optimal position, not only for visual but also for imaging. And so if you can keep things within that area of the sky, you're going to get the best possible views um, if there's if the conditions allow, okay? Now, of course, um, once again, to go with my theme here of seeing old friends, what am I gonna go to next? Pleiades. Either Pleiades, right? Yep, Pleiades has been up for a little while, Pleiades and the Seven Sisters, right? And here are now, we're looking at the Seven Sisters of the Pleiades, which is also known as the Subaru. I was talking to a few of you I can recognize from yesterday's talk. Um, it's the Subaru, right? So it's the same as that symbol on the front of a, an automobile. Uh, that's the Japanese name for uh, the Pleiades. And so this is an open cluster of stars that is um, currently moving through the sky as a unit because these stars were born together. Um, now one misconception that I actually had initially was that that, see that nebulosity, that gas that's surrounding it? I was under the impression at first that all of that wispy blue stuff was like original nebula. But I'm, uh, after some further investigation, I found out that that's actually not the case. Um, what's happening here is these, scar these stars are in motion. All stars are in motion as they go around the galaxy. And these particular ones are hitting a um, cloud of gas that's already kind of parked there. And they're interacting with that gas. But that gas was not the original gas they were formed from. Okay. So that was a misconception I had early on was that it was the original formation gas. Because guess what? Just down... From there is my other friend, Orion. And the Orion constellation, of course, is chock full of really cool stuff. Uh, and you've got your horse head, your flame, uh, nebula, and you've got this guy, uh, the Orion um, nebula complex. And this thing is just massive. And that is the original star formation process. And one of my interests is stellar evolution, right? The, the stars are born, live, and die. And so this is your original state. And it's, stars are being born, stars are growing, and then you've got a few you know, million years later, that gas and dust is going to be pu pushed away by the uh, radiation pressure of the stars. It's going to push that gas and dust away. As it, as it does that, it's going to clear its path, and there will be no gas. So that's what effectively I'm showing you here with um, the Pleiades, is that this one should be, by this point in its life, clear of that gas but it's not, okay? The blue of the blue star should indicate to you what kind of star? A very large star, okay? These are the short-lived blue giant type of stars generally. Um, that means that this has to be young, right? Because those big stars only, only live for a few hundred million years, whereas the, the other star types are gonna live for, for significantly longer. Our sun, 10 billion years, Red dwarfs, we think somewhere on the order of about a trillion years, given that our universe is only 13.8 billion years old, only. Um, a trillion is a thousand billion. These things are in their infancy. So we've never observed the death of a red dwarf, um, but uh, we know that these stars have to be young because of their size, which means they would have died already if it were, um, if it were old, okay? Um, now, I know there were some other things I wanted to get to, so I'm going to kind of move on. Uh, I want to make sure there's time for questions towards the end. But I want to stop now. Is there anybody who has any real questions at this point about the things I've been discussing so far? OK. Nothing groundbreaking at this point. Is, is, is that gas that Blaine's going through, could that gas be the gas from uh, Orion? Uh, I don't believe so. I think this is. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think. Okay. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, yes. The question was, uh, could the gas from the Pleiades be from the Orion Nebula? And I don't believe so. I think this is, although they're similarly placed in the sky, the distance factor is completely different. Um, and this gas cloud is not big enough to, to be in that area of the sky. Other questions? OK, so um, the reason I'm using this software in particular is it does provide you the ability to make um, observing lists, OK? 
Has anybody ever used an observing list, software observing lists? They're great, okay? So I had just kind of pulled up a few things here um, that I've you know, done in the past where, for example, um, we've got a Messier marathon, right? This is actually something that's kind of automatically in the, this system. And so it gives you a shot list effectively. The Messier marathon is effectively when you're out under uh, the night sky and you've got lots of people, uh, the goal is to get as many of the Messier objects, which um, were basically things that Charles Messier identified as things that were not comets and that he liked to ignore because he was a comet guy. Um, they happen to also be some of the best things in the sky. And it's a mixture of things. It's galaxies, it's nebulas, it's open clusters, it's, it's all sorts of stuff, um, which makes it a fun place to start as a beginner. Um, and it's the easiest stuff to find as far as deep sky objects go. And you can see here how it's highlighted, you know, kind of what's already up in the sky. You can see some of it's been grayed out. That means it's not available right now. And some of it is highlighted and it's in, like, it's obviously there. Now we can, we can organize and filter this all you want. You can, you know, try to get that optimal observing, you know, condition. And you can create your own lists. I started to make some of my own lists here, um, you know, just trying to plan. Uh, but, you know, if you're just getting started, this is probably your best bet. You might not know what exactly to search for, right? And so that Andromeda galaxy we talked about earlier, it will, it will guide us to those objects. Now, if you're more of an, you know, an imager, uh, this can, you know, computer software, of course, can also uh, control telescopes and things like that, um, which is, this software is capable of doing all of the above. Um, now, something else that I kind of wanted to point out is equipment. All right, so I've got tons of equipment in here. Um, and what I've basically tried to do is I've tried to create a list of, ob of uh, telescope equipment that um, I have had access to or would like to have access to. Um, and this provides me the ability to kind of plan because there are different telescopes for different purposes. There's a tool for every job, right? And so um, if I'm going to be observing uh, the Ring Nebula, M57, let me pull that up really quick. Okay, the Ring Nebula is, is very small. And if I try to use a wide field telescope on this thing, let me go back in time here a little bit, get it higher in the sky, more optimal. If I try to go in on this with a wide field telescope, it's gonna look like that. It's gonna look like a tiny little dot. I saw through that Dobsonian, the same one I looked at for Andromeda last night, the biggest view of the Ring Nebula I've ever seen in my life. Why? Because we were using a high focal length telescope with a small focal length eyepiece. In other words, it was giving me the highest magnification possible, right? Now that was a 16 inch Dobsonian, and so it could handle that magnification. If you have a telescope this big, don't expect good results by just magnifying things. It's, it's just not got the size. It needs to do that. But um, especially if it's tr not tracking, as you can see, this is actually the motion of the Earth when zoomed in at this level. So if you're trying to get there with a push to telescope that's rickety and, and small and you're trying to magnify way too much, like it's just frustrating. Maybe this isn't the object that you want to be looking for. And that's the kind of things you might want to be planning ahead for because now you're here, now the sky is in the perfect conditions. Maybe it could have been helpful to put your equipment list together within the software. And what that then lets you do is select different equipment and make these custom field of view indicators, okay? So that you can see what it would look like. You're simulating what would it look like to take uh, this telescope and this eyepiece and look at that object, okay, as far as the size and the field of view that it's at. So for example, um, let me get one up here. Um, okay, so I do a lot more imaging stuff, so I'm gonna just use a camera as an example here. Um, so this is my uh, Schmidt-Cassegrain Schmidt 
telescope, which is like a refractor, a reflector, I should say, um, one of the most popular telescopes out there. On uh, consumer Canon T3i DSLR, right? So I'm trying to take a picture of this through my telescope. I want to know what is it I'm going to see. And that box represents what my image will look like. Now, am I happy with that? Well, I have another telescope. Um, I have, or let's just say this. I have a camera lens, a 90 millimeter Tamron camera lens. But that would look like this. I can get a nice picture of Lyra. Where's the ring nebula? Uh, three pixels right there in the corner, <laughs> right? And so this really gives you a good sense coming into this. And now you're not wasting time under perfectly dark skies. You're making your plan. And within this now, you can, you can come right to this object, M57, once you got everything right. And you can click on it. And you can log an entry and add it to your observing list right here within the software. So now you're right there. You're happy with what you've got. And you can even create a favorite. You know? So if you want to come up here and you could say save favorite, and I want to call it Ring Nebula, um, and you um, say Cherry Springs or something. And you've got the time, the date, exactly when you want to look at it. And you can even organize it into a folder Okay. once you've got it in the favorites files. And now you have a plan in place. And you can literally sing, go down the, the different um, objects within your software as you're trying to, to do the observations, giving yourself options. And we talked about clouds earlier. Ring Nebula is covered by clouds. I've already got my telescope out. I've already got the camera in. Ring Nebula is not visible. Do I just give up? No, because now I can just say, OK, well, I don't even know. I'm like, now I'm out here. I'm trying to figure this stuff out. And I'm like, OK, Ring Nebula. Can I take Andromeda? Same telescope. Andromeda. I swear I know how to spell. Uh, OK, I, I want to take the same exact gear. And I want, that can, I want the C8, the schmidt cassegrain grain with the T3i. I want to take an image of Andromeda. Yeah, awesome. Let's do it. And then you get there, because we're new to this. Or, no, or you're not. It's a new object for you, right? No way, right? I'm getting here, and I'm realizing, well, maybe I could take a picture of its core. That wasn't my goal. Moving on, right? Any, uh, OK, so you guys, I'm sure somebody out here knows with this with this field of view, what's something else good? Something about the size of M57 Ring Nebula. Throw out the ideas. Helix. Helix. OK. So let's try Helix. And now you're not screwing around and wasting time. You might be 15 years into it like I am and still not sure if the image is going to be, or the eyepiece view is going to be what you think it's going to be. Here you can do this before you bother. And look at that. Your, your experience shows, right? Can you think of an object, though, you obviously have some experience here, that you aren't sure of, right? Like it's something you've been interested in. Uh, cat eye nebula. Cat's eye, OK. So now we're, we're, we're actually testing our own understanding. Uh, cat's eye, is it? There we go. Apostrophes. Um, so now we're going to test your, your idea, see if, it, if it's actually going to work or not. It's out. That's a good plus. That's also something helpful when it's not below the ground. <laughs> Anybody have a telescope slew like this before? And what do we think? No, let's zoom in. Oh my goodness, you get a dot. So even what we have is what is pretty much a very, very powerful magnification. We find that it's not enough. So you need even more with this object. Yeah. What was the one before the cat's eye? That was Helix. Yep. So 
by by kind of introducing the software here, you're providing a, a you know a, a way to do a quick check on your knowledge, whatever level you're at. Because it doesn't matter what level you're at, if you're wasting time, you're wasting time. And when if you like, and it's what, okay, you're coming up to enjoy the place, and you hear me talking about efficiencies, and you know, you can take that two ways. You can say, oh, you're focused on efficiencies. Just come and enjoy the experience at Cherry Springs. I'm trying to, right? I want to get the most out of it. That's what makes me happy here. What I'd hate to do is be up here and feel like I missed opportunities to see the stuff I came for. So, so for me, having this plan, having this efficiency, and to be honest, even here, just to have live software, to me that helps quite a bit. Now this is, this is the laptop version. Of course, you can do a tablet version or a phone version as well, right, with the Sky Safari software or any other planetarium software that's out there. The benefits here are, you know, you get a lot of these extra tools, the observing lists and uh, the equipment lists and the field of views um, and, and vast amounts of just crazy amounts of information that you can learn about each of these objects. Um, so, you know, I've worked with these folks for 15 years, uh, run the planetarium, as I said, Starry Night is what I run on the planetarium dome, so I'm super comfortable with it. You know, uh, I, I very, very much um, enjoy using this software myself. Uh, generate, can somebody help me out? 15 years of experience, and I don't know how to say that word, ephemeris? Okay, so um, you can do that, and it will produce um, these these tables that you know you can basically determine when things are optimally high in the sky, when things rise and set times, things like that. Super helpful. Um, you can even come to the bottom here. Oh, not to my, not that far down. And you can see this. Check this out. So at the bottom, oh, at the bottom there, what you're seeing is um, the sun and the moon. But now if I, collect, if I click on this, I should be able to get, um, start graphing the cat's eye nebula on top of everything else. And so what you're looking at here on this axis is zero on the horizon is the horizon. <laughs> and there's 50, here's I guess 90 is up top here. Um, and so the higher that the blue one is, which is um, Cat's Eye Nebula, the, the more close to its peak altitude it will reach and the better observing conditions you will have. And now if you do this and you're also in the process of moving through time, minute by minute, hour by hour, notice it starts to move, okay? And so you can see, is this the optimal timing and of course, you've got your bars of nighttime and daytime, right? And so, excuse me, so even without zooming in, if you're just trying to get a better idea, is this the optimal time to view a particular object, you can come through your lists here. Um, let's say we go back to the Messier objects quick. Um, and you wanna click on a random object here, let's say M35, I have no clue, okay? I've got everything I want here. I'm going to right click on this guy and I'll say start graphing. And now I've got a graph here. The lighter blue color now is going to be M35 and I can get a sense as to when is best to image it or view it by based on how high on this graph it is. There goes my copy. All, not all of it's gone, we're happy. Okay, <laughs> yes, I was up pretty late. So um, I don't wanna spend the entire time talking. It's 37 after, I've asked, been asked to do about 45 minutes or so. So questions, yeah. I, I, I have a question, I've got a, uh, an observation. Uh, that I got to the very end of it and then I dumped my coffee? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's a really easy way to do what you just did. Sure. Sure. Uh, March 21st, RA0. If you, you know what your date is, you know how far the sky is turned, you can calculate for each day when each object culminates on the meridian. Now you got your observing list in order of let's just go south sure. and go up and down. Sure. And it works beautifully. Yep. 
Yep. And, and what you've got there does a great job of it, but for one object at a time, can you make a list? Yes. Yes, and you can filter by the things you're talking about. You can filter by magnitude. You can filter by when it's going to rise, set, things like that. There's, it's, it's endless with the settings that you can do, um, but I'm trying to keep it pretty basic. Um, that's, that's something that any observer would find useful. Absolutely. Their list order by when it's going to be best to do. Absolutely. It's not hard to do. Sure. But, but, it, but, but going back to the beginning, though, uh, is that everyone's purpose, right? And it might be for you, um, but for me, I came up here to see fr old friends, right? And I wanted to see something that was going to set in the West. It was by no means going to be great, um, but it was the last chance I'd get to see it. And so the, that's what I'm saying. Is like you, you, this makes a flexible plan, and, and for you, I agree. That's a great way to get the best possible views, for sure, for sure. Other other questions? Yeah. This software is called uh, this software is called Starry Night. Is it subscription based? It's a purchase. Um, there are different levels of it. This is the, the Pro Plus, like the higher end of one. Um, but there are various different levels, and then there's a phone based and a tablet based one called Sky Safari that's also made by the same folks. Okay, and that's the same ones that have donated to the raffle. So you can put your ticket in, and you might win. Yep. Other questions. All the way in the back, yes, in purple. Yep. Did anybody get to see them? You saw them? Yep. Uh, the, the Eagle Nebula was the question for um, folks that couldn't hear. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yep. Yep. So I, I did not get a chance to see that, but yeah, you got a chance. Was it a good view? It was pretty good, um, you know, for the first hour, hour and a half or so. Okay. You know, anything, like you said, anything below on the horizon, you right. don't want to have a spirit. Was that on your shot list? Or just? It was. Well, Sagittarius or the, right. the southeast guy, yeah. Was on. Excellent, excellent. There were a couple others I was thinking, but I went ahead and went with that one. Yeah. Excellent, cool. excellent. Yes? If you're not sure what you want to look at, a lot of your go-to mounts will have a nightly turn. Right, right. Um, definitely the go-to mounts are, are going to be helpful in their ability to show you what's available in the sky. Um, what my, my purpose is like saying is that this is a pre-even being here pro process. If you, if you can do this before you leave to come to Cherry Springs in the days and months leading up to it, 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 will, it will give you the chance to do all of that preparation in advance. Uh, and most times um, with those go-to type of telescopes, you can even connect it via your laptop, even if you're doing visual observations. And I can go through that shot list now, I can go through my observing list, and I can just hit go to here on the laptop and it'll move it for you. So you, you, you really take out um, the guesswork by doing all this stuff in advance at home and you know, when it's daytime. But then it's not as frustrating. That's true. It's not as frustrating if you're doing this all in advance. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> I did see some other hands on this side in the back. Yes. I have a question. I'm a teacher, and I yes. know when they could something I'm a teacher also, um, and I use this software in my classroom. There is a version. Um, there's multiple versions uh, of Starry Night. There's a Starry Night Elementary, Middle School, High School with curriculum, and there's even a Starry Night College, and then there's a Starry Night College textbook. The textbook uses OpenStax textbook, which is a, a free and open source textbook. By the way, that's a really good resource for everybody. It's go to OpenStax Astronomy. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's always up to date. It's used by some of the, high, the best universities out there. Um, I'm using that in my high school astronomy classes, teaching a CP level, honors level course. Um, and I'm really enjoying it. So, uh, and it, it's very good. I'm more than happy to talk more about that with you separately. Any other questions? Yes? Just something I use it for. Um, I use a slightly different planetarium software. But, yep. um, I have a heavily obstructed backyard. So I actually upload a photo of my backyard onto it, and I can see literally when an object comes over the house, when it goes behind yep. a tree branch, and it just helps me with planning in my backyard specifically. Exactly, yeah. So yeah, you're, what you're saying here, you can make your own horizon. So I actually have done this at my school. Um, where basically I took a bunch of pictures 
in uh, 360 degrees, and then I stitched them all together and cut the sky out, and so it looks like my high school is right in front here, and you can, you can actually orient it so that it matches the actual true cardinal directions, and so you can actually go outside then and be like, okay, it's supposed to be right there, hey, there it is, and it's just about to come over the school in the next five minutes, kids, you know, and it's really cool. So yeah, absolutely, if you, if you really in, you want to get involved with, especially if you have um, trees or other obstructions, neighbors' houses, things like that, it's very helpful to, to make your own horizon panorama. Anything else, folks? All right, well, thank you so much. Um, I, I know that there's a turnover. Uh, what is coming up next? Do we have a... I have more time? Okay, I thought you wanted 45 minutes, so I, I can keep going. Okay. Okay, works for me, works for me. Excellent. Um, so let's keep the questions coming, if there are questions. And if not, I can certainly talk more. I have lots of things I can discuss. Okay. Um, so kind of coming back to um, some of this idea of creating the observing lists, um, maybe should I kind of try to help you sh so show you setting up some of this stuff? Um, so let's say, for example, you wanted to uh, create a new observing list. All right, you could, you could be selected on something already, and I know it's kind of hard to see this here. And I don't know, does my Mac allow me to zoom in? So I've got the option of whatever I'm selected, I can start the observing list with that, or I can just say, build a new observing list. Um, Let's just create a new observing list, and we'll call it Cherry Springs 2022. Okay, and it makes a file then. And now, um, when you're going through here, anytime you're selecting an object, let's just pick one. Let's go with one of our easy ones, like Orion. And now that I have it selected, and I'm looking at it here, I can add um, to an observing list right from there. And then it gives me a drop down menu of all the different things that I could add it to. Now, here's Cherry Springs 2022, and it's now been added to the list. There it is. Now, if I click on that, I have you know, the main, it basically will bring me back to that same place, um, and it gives me all the descriptions and things like that, but I could then add it, let's say you actually got to see it now, all right? And you wanna add some basic information about what you just did, right? If you're a journal or type of person and you wanna keep logs of things for future reference, um, especially if you're doing some sort of an imaging stuff that you can keep track of what's going on, what you did on a particular night, um, and you can associate with a particular observing list. Well, I want to do that. I want to associate it with the Cherry Springs observing list that we just made. So I've added it to that. Um, I can change what observing session it's coming from, um, where I'm viewing from, and I've got it set up already here um, for us to be in Cherry Springs Star Party, Pennsylvania, because your location matters. And let's say I want to make some notes here. So this is a presentation demonstration. That's how I actually made this list. So I'm just going to remind myself I didn't actually look at anything, you liar, right? Uh, OTAs, add telescopes. OK, I, let's say I want to add in here I was using um, a uh, Nagler 26. With, that's a type of eyepiece, OK? with um, a stellar view 80 millimeter telescope. It's a little tiny refracting telescope. Um, I can add or change that too. That one was the one for that particular telescope. Well, that wasn't the right thing. That wouldn't work very well, maybe. So maybe I, uh, my bigger telescope, I'm gonna use my stellar view 130 refractor, much more focal length, much more zooming um, with the same eyepiece, right? And I can add that now to the list. Okay, I, I found out I had, let's say I had two telescopes out, I observed through both. 
Okay, now I would say, okay, wow, the, uh, the 130 millimeter telescope was the better option for this object, right? In the future, bring along a shorter focal length eyepiece, right, for more magnification, right? And now, I don't own it yet, but I've kind of kept track of the fact that I was up here and I didn't get what I wanted out of an experience and that if I'm going to go purchase something in the future, I can, I can check on this, you know, objects of interest that I have and I'm going to try to start planning ahead for future things. Um, or maybe I just forgot it at home or left it at home. Um, so, which is a real, a real issue, right? Leaving things at home. So, you know, that's basically how you build an observing list and build a log. This is a log entry. The observing list is kind of the plan. And then the log entry is, I followed through. Um, and by keeping track of this kind of stuff and keeping good notes, you can, you can advance and kind of keep your work that you've done, especially if you're doing it very intermittently like I have to right now. You know, you gain a bunch of traction, you learn a bunch of stuff, and then you forget it. And you gotta relearn it when you get back up into the dark skies again, and now you're fumbling around in the dark. This can give you one layer of kind of like offloading and downloading into the computer your brain. Uh, these are the thoughts you had last time, right there. Uh, and I'm gonna just kind of mention here, this connects also with a, another thing that they're giving away for free um, with this is called Live Sky. Um, the basic idea here is that um, this is stuck on my laptop, right? But if you um, go to the Live Sky, oh, I don't have the wireless internet here. Sorry, it's an internet based um, cloud service, basically, where it will take all of your settings, all of your favorites, all of your observing lists, all of that kind of stuff, and it will put it to the cloud. And then if you uh, use the Sky Safari, uh, software, you can then have that same information on your tablet or phone. When you make it on your tablet or phone, it goes to Live Sky and then it comes back down to Sky Safari or Starry Night on your laptop if you want to have both. Um, and the more and more integration is happening with, like, for example, Celestron telescopes have a lot of the Sky Safari stuff embedded within them now. Um, so you really kind of get a lot of the integration then, the benefits. Um, so that's, that's the logs. Any questions about that stuff? All right. Uh, this is, this is not a subscription. Um, it's like one-time purchase for, uh, both the, both the different softwares. So Sky Safari is a one-time purchase and, uh, Starry Night's the same way. Now Live Sky is a subscription. That is a difference. But that's not required to run either software. Um, winter Star Party. Okay. Um, does anybody know close to where that would be? Uh, it would be on the Florida Keys. Let's just kind of select a random-ish place down there in the Florida Keys area. View from selected location. Watch. We'll take up off the planet Earth. And now we'll fly. You're going to travel. You're going to go somewhere else. You don't want to be, you know, guessing. You've flown 2,000, 3,000 miles, and now you're in a new location. You've never been there before. You have no idea. You've never even seen these constellations before because you're seeing the southern hemisphere. Everything's going to be new, right? Um, now your, your same settings, your same objects, your same observing list, everything is here, and you can kind of build off of the work that you're capable of doing here in Pennsylvania um, with, with a new location um, at a different date or time of the year. February 13th. February 13th. I don't know why I'm seeing this weird field of view thing going on. What's that? Am I looking straight down? Oh, yes. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. I'm looking at a puddle that's reflecting everything. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> that was weird. Okay, so February 13th, you said, is the winter star party. And so, yeah, look, look at this. This is phenomenal in the south. I, I have never even heard 
of some of these, right? Like, it's just not possible from where we live to view uh, many of these objects. And you can kind of make your way around. Look how much higher Sagittarius is, by the way, in the sky. And so um, you're going to be able to see a lot more clear than you would be able to here because it's not as low on the horizon. Right? Um, but what do you sacrifice? Any now? No. <laughs> OK, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, you sacrifice some of your circumpolar constellations. Um, so let me just kind of let me kind of go here to my settings again. Um, another thing that's kind of cool is the circumpolar region. OK? So it's super hard to see here because it's red. Give me a second here. Let me see if I can get this to be a different color so you guys can see it better. All right, I'll make it white. All right, now can, can you see it from the back there? There's a circle that's been drawn. See it? Now that circle is, I'm going to turn off these field of view indicators. That circle is the part of the sky that we will be able to see throughout a night. Um, so notice everything is turning around the center of that circle, which is what? Polaris, the North Star. Polaris is very close to the North, Circum the North Celestial Pole, which is the North Pole of Earth, the actual axis of the Earth's rotation. Polaris is about, a, about a, one pinky's width or about a degree away from that position. So it's not exactly in the center. It does move slightly. But notice how these constellations never set or rise. They're always in the sky. And so you lose by going to Florida the size of this circle. Because if you measure from the horizon to the North, Circum the North Celestial Pole, in, in other words, Polaris, the angle from here to here is equal to your latitude. So if you're in Florida, what is over this is, 20 some degrees latitude or whatever, then you have a 22 degree circle in terms of its radius. Now if we fly to Alaska, let's change our location. Um, let's see, oh, view from, let's go up here to Alaska. Lift up off planet Earth. And we'll land there. This time, hopefully, not staring into the ground. We'll get there really quick. Or not, maybe I messed it up. Try that again. There we go. Oh, it's about to land. OK. So now, when we look up, we're going to look to that same place in the sky. And we're going to find what? We're in Alaska. What's going to change? We won't see the southern constellations anymore, right? And what will happen to our circumpolar region? It gets bigger. It gets, e remember, equal to your latitude. Look how big the circumpolar region is now. Now, it's Polaris' altitude on the local meridian, right, is like, this is 60, here's 50, it's at like 56 degrees north latitude. So you now have, instead of a 20-some degree radius circle, you have a 56 degree radius circle, meaning that more constellations will never rise or set, right? So now, when time is moving forward, day, uh, hour by hour, day by day, these never rise or set. They're always in the sky. Where would I go to have the entire sky be circumpolar? The North Pole. Let's try it. So um, going to the North Pole, view from. North Pole. Is anybody here from Canada? Is North Pole actually in Canada? 
It says International Waters now on this one. Interesting. My students one, um, same software, says it's in Canada. Is it part of? Shared. Is it shared? OK. I always wondered that. Shared with who? Everyone. Everyone. OK, so it is International Waters. OK, OK. So now that we're going here to the North Pole, where will the center of your circumpolar region be? Straight up. Zenith. zenith. Right, exactly, straight up. It will be at your zenith. So now we look straight up in the air. And there is, there is Ursa Minor, the, the little dipper. We're going to zoom out. We'll see the entire sky now. We'll never rise and we'll never set. It will just spin in a circle but you don't see any Southern Hemisphere constellations. Any, none, zero, zip, nada, okay? South Pole, same thing, right? Now, check this out. Is there the next speaker here yet? Is the next speaker here yet? No? no? Okay. All right, well, you just, tell, you just tell me when you'd like me to stop. Okay, so I'm gonna try something cool here. Um, Hopefully it's not going to go too fast. There we go. Oh, so I've got time moving forward. Which direction is it rotating? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Counterclockwise, right? Everything's going around counterclockwise. Let's fly to the South Pole quick. So in going to the South Pole, what's your prediction? Make a hypothesis. Talk to your neighbor. <laughs> That's my teacher in this. Okay. So why? Why is it south? Why is south clockwise? You said it's clockwise. Because it's the opposite. It's your guess. Okay. Is Earth changing its this, this direction of rotation? No. No. But what's perception. our perception is changing. If you think about it, if you're standing on the North Pole, our feet are in this direction, and if you're on the South Pole, they're upside down compared to us. So the Earth's rotating in the same direction, but the sky will in fact appear to be um, moving in a different direction. And the constellations are all upside down. Yes, uh, the constellations will be upside down, but because we're so far different, there's going to be none of the same ones. If you were seeing part of the Southern Hemisphere, yeah, Orion would be flipped upside down, yep. I really like the constellation of Orion because his belt effectively is the celestial equator. And so his upper body is in the northern hemisphere and his lower body is in the southern hemisphere. And so if you can find Orion, which is super easy, one of the brightest things in the sky, you can now get an understanding of approximately where south begins and north begins on the, on the sky. I don't know why it's not landing here. I'll give it one more shot and then we're going we're gonna to move on. Slash, I'll wrap up. There we go. Views from selected. So Dave, the Magellanic clouds in the, in the southern hemisphere, are those naked eye? Can you see them naked eye? Do you know? I, I do believe they are, but I've never seen it and can't confirm it. Okay. I, don't, I don't know. They are? Okay. I, I have family in Australia, and uh, they made the mistake of telling me that I can come and stay there and any, as long as I want any time. They don't know that I am going to retire there and I'm going to never have to deal with summer ever again. I'm going to live there in our winter, and I'm going to live here in our summertime so that I don't have to deal with that. All right, folks. Um, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, any last questions before I, I head out? You're more than, more than welcome to talk to you uh, afterwards as well. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you.